so good morning everyone again a nice monday and we will discuss a very important topic palliative this is a topic for you how to cope up uh, as a palliative care physician and this topic will be taken by will be covered by dr jayata uh, and dr jayata will explain you why aisha is not there today and uh, i request dr jayata to start the topic i start the discussion and we all are looking forward that definitely there must be something to learn from this uh, lecture dr jayata we all know head of palliative medicine at tata memorial hospital and uh, you see him you see her so many times off and on uh, giving comments and introducing her team thank you dr jayata please go ahead and start Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you again for including us in the training program. Uh, so this presentation I am doing uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Aisha Patari and uh, myself. Uh, Dr. Aisha uh, unfortunately had a, a road traffic accident. She is okay, uh, thankfully, but her husband had a fracture. uh so she has made the presentation uh but because of her circumstances i thought it is better uh, we are talking about coping after all and i did not want to put an additional stress on her already uh, difficult circumstances she's better she's joined now uh but the presentation will be done by me uh so again good morning to everybody and uh, thank you for joining uh, uh so why talk about this uh the reason to talk about this is because we are uh, forever uh, dealing in palliative care professionals are always dealing with chronic illness and end of life our everyday work involves difficult conversation and for all of us i don't think a single day goes by without any challenging work experience uh, experiences and we are constantly faced with death and dying when we have been working as a uh, simultaneously palliative medicine has really grown so significantly uh in india of course in the whole world as a discipline and palliative care professionals are having so many professionals so much of experience cumulative experience and when we talk about coping and resilience we are really looking at whether i mean what factors are protective what factors are risk factors uh, do they remain stable do they change and uh, over the last few years there's been some sort of different literature in terms of both coping and resilience in palliative care professionals so i will talk uh, 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 talk uh, in regards to that so our objectives for today are to understand and learn about the concepts of both coping as well as resilience and the influencing factors and having learned that how do we promote and how do we evolve effective strategies to uh to um uh, uh to uh, put into practice so we know uh or we should know that coping is is any thought or behavior which is uh, made uh, suddenly this thing uh, it to manage any internal or external stressful situations and um, which we no should remember is that coping is something an action a thought behavior action which is conscious and it is voluntary and hence different from defense me mechanisms which are unconscious which are also for managing stress but coping is different from defense mechanisms and 
The simple definition is that thoughts and behaviors to manage internal and external stressful situations. And we know that Lazarus and Folkman so famously and so fantastically defined uh, coping as the individual's constantly changing cognitive and behavioral efforts to manage a specific external and or internal demands that are appraised as taxing or exceeding the resources of the person. So why do we have coping? Because there is a stress and I am able to deal with the stress. But if the stress becomes too much or my resources are not that as much to deal with that particular stress, there would be an imbalance and then I need to bring in some reinforcement and that would be my coping strategy. And coping in the literature otherwise generally seems to be coping styles seem to be stable across time and environment. So why do coping, why, does, why is coping required and what are the factors? So there has to be a stressor. There has to be a stressor. And in that, when the stressor happens, there are two things. One is that I have my own personality. I know what I do, what are my strengths, etc. I am not alone. I have my social support. So with that, we'll be looking at that stressor and we will appraise that stressor. And having appraised that stressor, what is it? Can I do it? Do I have the strength? Do I have some people to help me? What are my thoughts? What are my actions? What have I done before? And I will do uh, some coping strategies. And depending on the outcomes of the coping strategies, it could be successful, it could be unsuccessful. The outcomes can be that I have resolved my stress, or I am still not able to do it. So what is it scoping exactly? It's an event to reduce the harmful effect of the event. So uh, we, do not, uh, we do not really ask for, uh, say, coping in relation to any positive environment that we just seem to enjoy. So coping, we have to see that factor which we perceive as stress and how much is at harm how much is that threat? Is it a harmless thing or is it a threat? Is it a threatful thing? So if it is a threat, then what can I do? I can get very, uh, I can get very uh, anxious, or I can, I can, I want to remove that anxiety and ang whatever emotions I'm feeling. So it can be emotion focused, or I could go head on to, uh, to uh, face that threat, and that would be problem focused. And problem focus seems to have a favorable outcome and that would give a positive emotion. Emotion focus, however, could be favorable, could be unfavorable. If emotion focus, I am sad and I am crying all the time and not doing anything about it, then that will be cause more distress. However, emotion focus, I am crying and I want to do something about it. I will do some problem focus and then I will uh, change that. So it can be what we can discuss coping styles can be and anything that we do uh, to affect our coping are called coping styles or coping mechanisms or coping strategies. So they can be used sort of interchangeably. And it can be reactive, that is after the stressor has happened, or it can be proactive, that is I employ strategies to, to for future stressors, anticipating future stressors. It can be adaptive, that it helps me come overcome the stress and it is helping me by with the positive emotions and having managed it, or it can be maladaptive, that it is not really helping me. So adaptive, I can do something, problem focused, I can do, I had to prepare this presentation, I needed to change it, I had done all the work, but I had to change it, I could do it. Or maladaptive, I could just say, oh, forget it, let me just uh, go and take a glass of wine, so drinking, smoking, etc. cetera, are maladaptive. And in the same same thing is, uh, is either healthy when it is actually subserving to what your objective is, or unhealthy, as I have discussed before. 
and then it can be then it can be something to do with an engagement coping or a disengagement coping and you can see that the engagement copings are adaptive and the disengagement copings are maladaptive so engagement copings would be sort of some direct action like planning social support you do something actually to overcome the stress and uh, fighting spirit etc maladaptive it's about distancing avoidance isolation alcohol drug use and behavioral disengagement so these are commonly what we talk about when we talk about uh, uh, coping in patients caregivers etc so when uh, lazarus and spokesman uh, richard lazarus proposed the two types of coping it was mainly those problem focused or emotion focused so we we added to the construct and it was more of appraisal focused whereas you know we detect we do rational thinking we can use a positive reinterpretation and we can have you know we find humor in the situation and do something and we may turn to uh, religion and over time then some more uh, some more concepts came in which is as you can see here so there was this avoidant which was mainly the behavioral disengagement bit but the other bit is the social support so the emotional support we seek support from our friends family so either an instrumental emotional support or actually seeking support and and of course then later on it is coming as to what do we mean of the stressor what that stressor means to us and can we and and what are we using our values and beliefs to make some sense of the stressor and have coping styles that will cause some either meaning making or meaning changing so there are different tools to measure coping this is not an exhaustive list and these are some of the uh, things that i've mentioned the most common ones that have been used especially in professionals are the cope uh, inventory and resulting from that a short term one a short item one called the brief cope inventory and also the the there's something called as the religious cope or the uh, brief r cope which is based on that the others are these ways of coping questionnaire coping strategies questionnaire coping response inventory coping self efficacy scales brief really resilient coping scale and proactive coping inventory so you can see there are you know there's a big scale like 60 items 42 items 48 items the mid range like 26 27 28 items and a brief resilient coping scale is about four items there's not an exhaustive list i haven't included all the reliability validity because our our work is uh, something else today so uh, when we talk of coping it's always been that it has been a person and an environment kind of dynamic so in same palliative care we have our stressors right we have our uh, personal uh, stressors that we can have uh, that would be sort of our personalities and our family things and our workload etc Uh, our our own belief systems that is there and that will be the organizational work that we are doing so our workload our every our kind of work that we are doing and especially in palliative medicine it is about death and dying very ill patients pediatric patients uh, caregivers and along with that we have again similar to deal with that we can have our personal coping style so what can we do we can we can do some physical activity we have our self care activities or we can have organizational coping like regular meetings we have our team meetings etc so now over the it, this is a very sort of two dimension construct and as it really so what we can do we can uh, we can use our in a two dimension construct then we can use our problem focus our emotion focus etc but the coping literature in healthcare professionals has evolved and especially in palliative care so let's look at what coping styles we can 
have in palliative care. These are the references I have used, which are there at the end of the uh, presentation. So you can look them up. So uh, the coping styles which we have can be divided into proactive, meaning something that we are going to do. So it's going to be action oriented. Um, Self-care based, that is we, we are going to do something for ourselves and uh, we are going to have some activities and that would be the self-care based uh, coping uh, that is taking care of ourselves. Self-transformation is adaptation basically because every day we are dealing with such uh, uh, you know, it's almost traumatic experiences. So self-transformation self is all about adaptation. And because of the work that we are doing every time in the work with people, with team, with other professionals, and with the kind of work that we're doing, it's about encountering deep professional meaning. So let's go and see each one what we actually can do. And my request to you is, as I am talking, everybody, junior, senior, and uh, I don't mean to be uh, I don't mean to be imposing or anything, but I thought since we are doing this exercise, we might as well, when I'm talking through, you can just take a paper and pencil and write down as many that you use, you use every day. And the other things, can you be using that at some point? But of course, it all depends on our personality and what we know, what we learn. But let's just learn together since we are having this session. So, uh, so proactive, as I said, it is something that we will do proactively and it is more action oriented. So uh, what is it that we do for this? It is about, you know, that we accept that we are, we are actively responsible towards our patients and caregivers, that is we do every day, and also to ourselves. We are responsible for ourselves. We plan and organize our work so that we can be confident in our work. We build our self-confidence and we can focus on it. And if we have that, we can manage our situations in our practice, not just our situations, but also as our emotions. So like if we have, uh, we are going on, we are on an on-call, uh, we are going to be on duty in the OPD. So we accept that we are responsible, but we are responsible for ourselves also. We can have a planning and an organization, a team, that is why we have rotas and we know who's working where and how is it that we are going to manage. So I have, I, I know how to do myself. And if I have any problem, I will go and approach my senior. So the whole concept here, it is about trust and control. And that is how it increases. The proactive measures, coping measures will increase the trust and control. Let's go to the second one, and that is protecting self. Uh, protecting self can happen at three levels. One is it is self-care based, remember? So then we have we have to be aware of that. So we have to have some self-knowledge and self-awareness that this is what I need to do. And sometimes I don't do this thing properly. So then maybe I should I should be self-aware. Without that self-aware, I cannot go to the next level. And since I am self-aware, what can I do for that? So I can take rest, I can have some sleep schedule, I can have some hobbies, I can indulge in, I can have some uh, painting, listening, the music, uh, and, uh, and not binging on Netflix that I usually do, but otherwise some hobbies, which is going to be different from the work that we are doing. and behavioral disengagement and this behavioral disengagement is at a this is at a third level that is at a, a higher level by behavioral disengagement i don't mean the way that other coping styles have been is just you know you take alcohol you take 
you smoke, you go to parties, you just switch off, fine, that is one way. But this is at a very higher level in a good way that I tell myself that I, when I leave work, I leave work. So we switch off. We switch off work when at home, and sorry, I've not completed this, and we don't bring home to work. And basically, it's the switch off working, uh, working when I'm home. And this is the professional uh, will disengage, but actually, it, they're disengaging for better engagement with their work. Because if you're continuously engaged, you're continuously entwined, you don't get that space between you and work. And that can be uh, one of the factors towards less coping, less resilience, more burnout. And so this is self-care based. It's, about, it's more progressive. And the whole thing is about engagement or better engagement through disengagement and disengagement is that these professions is not like that they are they don't have compassion they don't have empathy they don't care about their work they don't care about the patients whom they have been seeing it's not like that it is just that they are disengaging at that time to have so that they come back the next day and engage better the third one is self-transforming and this is again very important. Um, it's about accepting professional and personal, mainly personal and sorry, not mainly personal and professional limits. And why is that important? It's important because the way that we are working and what patients we are seeing every day. It is. It is about you know, that we, we have to overcome our initial frustrations and our frustrations happen every morning. We want, we see our patients, we send to our colleagues, they don't do, they say best supportive care, send them back when there is actually something that can be done to reverse the situation, correct the cause, improve quality of life, get into a hassle. But so that is going to be initial frustrations. And sometimes frustrations, of course, because whatever we did did not really help. But so it is not it is not our fault that the patients are ill. So we accept those limits, and we uh, we can we can have those these activities which will help us be self transforming things. Is that and of course with professional experience comes professional maturity, and we learn by and by. We also need to have that previous thing about having a balance and harmony between work and personal and personal and professional. And at some point, and we are always doing it, is about what do we mean? We review life in general, life for us as such. What meaning do we have of life? What meaning do we give? to death and what is our purpose what is everyone's purpose so then we it is it is this concept of the wounded healer and the wounded healer is just that we want to help but we know that we are not god we are not omnipotent and there are going to be there are going to be resources that will help including the patients themselves including the belief that the patients have their 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 innate trait to have that their innate characteristics so that can be also with the, the patients will have their abilities within themselves caregivers will also have their abilities within themselves to sort of heal psychologically and spiritually. So this is that we accept our limits that we are not omnipotent and we, there are some vulnerability and we do have some limits when we are helping patients. And this will happen through continuous reflection. And that is when we embark on the journey. So I guess these are some things which will happen towards you know, mid career, later career, that kind of thing. And it has been seen that those who use these self transforming coping styles uh, score better on the burnout dimension.
the last one which is a uh, quite a meaningful one is about encountering finding deep professional meaning and that is we have to have our deep meaning in what we are doing why are we working in palliative care and that has has relationship with your job satisfaction as well as professional growth so we have that sense of achievement and although our patients are dying we still think that that is what is our purpose that is what we are here for we are here for a certain work if we don't do it no one else can do it how how we do it no one else can do it better so it is that sense of achievement and the meaning of work that we perform and the feeling that the health care that we provide makes a difference and this was by you know coming through that belief that we adopt ourselves we open we open ourselves to new experience learn from experience and have realistic expectations and this again is about what meaning we make of our work not just our work what meaning we make of that stressor that we are facing at that time and if if that meaning is serving us at that time that's good if it is not serving us at that time maybe we need to change that meaning so it's not just meaning making it is also changing the meaning and that is how we evolve and this has seen to be helpful in bettering our professional and spiritual quality of life okay so um suddenly changing from some uh, deep things that i've been saying uh to something like this and i want to talk about factors which are going to influence the coping style so this is uh, i'm a marvel fan and i'm a superhero fan and this is a scene from the famous scene from the avengers in new york city the first avengers so when you see this what is it that that you think of and this is of course to the juniors or whoever is a marvel fan and we have three minutes so please tell me or please write on the chat box and i am i'm monitoring the chat but please talk we are uh, this is a it is a teaching and a learning session and let's have fun excellent so we have uh, shruti and ajila have said that it is about teamwork absolutely anything else stress response yes what was the stress who was coming here loki or thanos it is loki this time yeah okay that's another great one yes ponte uh, white punita what he said is unique style trend facing challenges in collaboration shankar has said isha has said together we can make things better is not great any more right team with different abilities so do you see where we am getting to see where we are getting so what are the things which are going to influence uh uh these uh, coping styles that we have so we can find things and come out to see it together and we are there to help so we talk about we are palliative care providers uh these are avengers so uh we may not call ourselves avengers but we can call ourselves superheroes because we are there every day fighting things and how do we work better we have our own abilities which everybody here has that we have we work as a team so the abilities are there but we also need to train right and not, none of them have come here without being prepared without their training despite their abilities so we need to have our abilities but we also have to train so the abilities are our professional uh, abilities 
our uh, personal abilities, but we need to train. That is why training is important. The third thing is we need to work as a team. So in palliative care, we are a healthcare team. And um, anything else? We work together. We are passionate about our work because we are believing, you know, destroying Loki when he comes here when he's really, really bad. And 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 who's our boss? Who's our boss? No, who's their boss? Does the boss help or is the boss sort of uh, uh, yelling at them and shouting at them? Who's their boss? Anybody? Who's our Avengers boss? Nick Fury. Yes, thank you, Kashish. Yes, Nick Fury. So you have to have that good boss. And because boss represents the system, a lot goes on against the system. So what do we have? Now you see each of those things that I told you is it can have uh, the meaning which is a benefit or it can in certain contexts and in certain situation, it would be a good thing. And uh, the other thing it would be, a, it will not be a really a good thing. So if we consider training, so if we are well trained, we have that confidence. And if we are lacking training, lacking the support through training, we are ill prepared. And that's what happens, right? You see, when you come in, it's first year, second year, third year, you see evolving through that. So by the third year, when you come, you've been gone through good training and that gives confidence, right? The healthcare team. If you have a team, where the team is good and everybody is helping you and everybody is supporting, isn't that such a nice thing, supportive colleague? So that would be a favorable factor. But if you have ooh, or those people who are always having a very negative, uh, we cannot really communicate, they just clam up, we can't share anything, that is not going to be a protective factor, that will be a risk factor then. And same thing is about personal and family characteristics. If we have a, a helpful nature, and we have a supportive family, uh, supportive family, that is a protective factor. But that one person in the team or a few people in the team have that dysfunctional behavior is not in the personal. If we have dysfunctional behaviors, if people in our family have this, it becomes a risk factor. And same thing about professional motivation. We have that passion for work and vocation in palliative care. We are going to be working for what we believe in. But sometimes what happens, we get into palliative care out of no, we did not have any control over that. And we wanted to do something else. And that's the gap between expectations and reality. And then that becomes a risk factor. Um, uh, Nick Fury was, I thought, very helpful. So it need administrative champions and appreciation from the organization. But if it is the other way, uh, poor working conditions, heavy workload, institutional policies, which don't help you, uh, that is not going to be good. And of course, patient-centered stressors and that I couldn't you, show you in the Avengers uh, photo, but it is about Patient-centered, you know, patients express satisfaction with how you have treated them. They come back, caregivers come back after their death. And that is such a nice feeling and that will help as a, as a protective factor. Whereas somebody comes and comes and it's a terrible experience in the casualty. Somebody has died and they are threatening to sue and that happens so often. And that's such a traumatic and negative emotional experiences. So factors influencing is not just um, either good or bad. It has to be taken in the context when it is happening and it's in the context of our abilities also. So this is how it is a little different from the other coping process model that we see elsewhere. So in palliative care, we have this, that you remember I said that they were stable, they were stable through time. In palliative care, it is very dynamic. 
and it is going to change with time and experience and also we are not going to use one coping style right we're going to use different combinations we can have a problem focus we can have emotion focus and i think we are using meaning making at all times and to all this we have to have a lot of introspection so how does it all happen that it happens through we are the person we are the person who need some training so that's a personal characteristic we need the training and the training is in the context of person as well as team and in all this we have our emotional burden the family the systemic stressors the motivation the systemic stressors and the emotional burden of the family are the only two risk factors that are there which i uh, showed you before the rest of the factors can change depending on the context but systemic factors and you know when patients have very strong negative emotions emotional experience shocking experience we we will see that in the resilience uh, time that we spend so that is going to be and you can see that the whole thing it is not uh, it is not stable it is dynamic and it is changing and it is evolving and time and experience uh, count for that sorry so with uh, we will take questions about coping and you please can some only moderating uh, please uh, uh, please uh, write down your questions for coping as and when when you think of that uh, in the interest of time i shall move on to our next thing and that is about resilience and again i am very fond of books and movies and when we think about resilience there are some people whom you can think of i'm sure some some people come in your mind uh, either and some people come in your mind in real life and in fiction and for me when i think of resilience i can think of that miserable in hunger games trilogy i can also think of Harry Potter and resilience and all his friends so moving over to resilience now we've seen coping what was coping coping was the ability to deal with the stressor as it happens what is resilience resilience is a positive response to adversities and adversities can be stressors in everyday life to key life altering events and it is how we respond to those adver adversities and how we bounce back from those adversities so it can be both a trait that it is there within us and a process that we learn gradually and it can be in so it can be inherited or it can be learned it can be present or it can be absent and we can just see that so it was originally conceptualized as a trait and it was supposed to be a stable attribute uh, you know because of your personality but more recently it is sort of a result of multiple factors and that like coping it is sort of contextual as well as dynamic process of adaptation and the definitions continue to advance and grow and the whole thing is that it is a it can be a complex response to adversity uh, it means the ability to adapt to challenging situations and it depends on not just personal strength and also social support so katna sevadeen has her personal strength but she has in social support with gail pita and uh, hemet and it is the 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 commonest definition of resilience that we say is the ability to bounce back after something a disastrous trauma or a severe trauma has happened and it is resilience is protective against burnout and there are three components which is as we say strength of the individual the ability to rise above the adversity and a positive adaptation now 
coping we know could be sort of negative positive in different circumstances when we talk about resilience we mean a positive adaptation and these are some tools to measure resilience which you can look at when you get the presentation so uh, these are some of the tools and some of them have, uh, aisha has written in detail so you can get through this is something we need to know uh, because this was aimed to uh, develop this particular tool situational judgment test uh, sorry test was uh, developed to measure behaviors associated with resilience among palliative uh, care providers and it was uh, situational judgment was found to be positively correlated with self report measures of resilience and there are different psychobiological mechanisms of resilience it's about neurotransmitters it's about areas in the brain mainly the prefrontal cortex as well as the amygdala and uh, a positive emotions and neural network so what are the factors influencing resilience then so the ones which are marked in orange are ones which are negatively correlated with resilience the ones which i have marked in uh, green are whatever that is for better uh, resilience a higher uh, resilience that that is there so a uh, death anxiety has been death anxiety has been uh, a, a higher that anxiety is going to correlate with lower resilience uh, and uh, lower res uh, higher resilience uh, people with low death anxiety will have high resilience uh, traumatic experience uh, traumatic experience so in the context and this is important why because every day we are uh, working with death uh death anxiety is not just something that will work in the patients and caregivers it's also going to be with us so that is the context and uh, we are uh, those so what we can do is we can develop measures where we can make meaning of experience of grief and uh, grief and loss and uh, and uh, and help help ourselves for traumatic experience what happens is the scholars it is a traumatic experience not just for ourselves but the patients are going through a traumatic experience so when patients are going through a traumatic experience the care the, the healthcare professionals the palliative care professionals are also experiencing that and that is called as a secondary traumatic stress through the patient stress we are also experiencing the uh, secondary tra uh, traumatic stress and that can affect our uh, feelings of uh, feelings our self esteem our own hope so if there is that we feel that so much our resilience will be less but sometimes what happens is through secondary traumatic stress we can also grow and that is called as a post -trauma, uh, post traumatic growth and through that we can sort of have some uh, thoughts about our own perception about ourselves we can have changes in our interpersonal relationship and we can rethink our philosophy of life uh, so vicarious post traumatic growth has been helpful and it can be a factor against burnout now we know about uh, i'm sorry we know about burnout and it is about emotional exhaustion and uh, low sense of personal achievement and um, depersonalization so emotional exhaustion and personal low personal accomplishment uh, those with high resilience will have less uh burnout scores and then if we can develop uh, measures for that we can reduce uh, we can reduce burnout and increase work satisfaction um it's always important to have hope and when we are working so those with hope and sort of an optimistic uh, view of life i know it's difficult to be optimistic when we are faced with death and dying uh that can be helpful 
and a compassion satisfaction that we are working and our compassion is not causing us to sort of get tired it's not compassion fatigue and a compassion satisfaction is going to be um helpful or uh, well, uh, sorry compassion satisfaction is going to be okay helpful for that and in all these factors i'm really rushing through now because we don't have much time uh, in all these factors we have seen that you know any openness to new experience and a sense of humor are really something which help build uh, help build uh, resilience and for building resilience uh, some investigators have done some intervention program uh, one of which is this a relaxation response resiliency program for palliative care clinicians which is based on cognitive behavioral therapy and positive psychology uh, this is mainly for you know through breath awareness exercise and that way we reduce the stress and we increase connection with others and they have found that there has been a statistically significant reduction in perceived stress and increase in high perspective increase in perspective taking with a moderate to high effect size a second program is this resiliency development program which are mainly educational sessions uh, talking about compassion satisfaction and fatigue vicarious trauma self care our resilience and quality of life it involves self assessment questionnaires and group discussion and at the end of four or uh, six months they found that compassion satisfaction increased and burnout reduced and the implication is that we we need to be sort of uh, having this self awareness and these resiliency program will improve well being so uh, studies have shown that high resilience had a strong correlation with high persistence high self directedness and low avoidance of challenges resilience is a personal resource with personal positive adaptation and a protective factor against burnout and with uh, high scores of resilience correlated with high levels of hope and the themes for resilience were were exposure to dread stress and coping and uh, one of the studies had that psychological well-being related to self care practice is in palliative care professions one study on that and this this sort of the the uh, what it says is that in palliative care professionals resilience can be a process modulator as well as a facilitator we know that burnout stress that anxiety if we have that that can be that can sort of uh, have if we have low resilience we'll have more of that but we have to we have to look at all this and how we can modulate this to have these other factors which can be helpful which is post traumatic growth compassion satisfaction and positive thinking so just while uh, going out uh, we have to we know all about burnout although this is not the uh, remit of this session but there are certain related concepts i need to uh, talk about which is burnout which we know with three components with emotional exhaustion depersonalization and lack of personal achievement uh, another uh, predictors are this we know it is a mismatch between personal and work environment and it can why it's important that it can have all these negative effects so we need some strategies in place at personal level and especially in the organization to reduce burnout uh, a related concept is uh, concept is uh, 
uh, compassion fatigue, which is not as severe as burnout, but it's, it's a little, but it's a compassion fatigue. It's sort of an indicator that burnout might be on the way. And the other thing that we go through is about moral distress, that we have to do things sometimes which we are not ethically, morally comfortable, but organization, institution, policy, et cetera, have to be done. And uh, for all that we have talked about, uh, for coping mechanisms, what are the implications for practice? In palliative care professionals, it is not just so simple and airtight about being person and environment. It is not just problem and emotion focus. It is always evolving and it includes higher practices like meaning making and transformative. And all this is interrelational and resilience is both process modulator and a facilitator. And to we have to uh, inculcate and develop programs in our institution, uh, not just in the organization, but also at the individual and at the team level so that we can foster well-being because both these concepts are very important because it's your reaction to adversity and not the adversity itself that determines how your life story will develop. Uh, these are the references and thank you so much for listening. Excellent, Jada. And, uh, thank you, you ma'am. So excellent. Amazing. Um, okay. I don't have any questions. But we or... have uh, 10 minutes to discuss. We have 10 minutes. Questions or comments? Anyone? Want Thank you to everybody. To... Sorry. Thank you to everybody who said uh, good presentation. Thank you so much. Questions? <laughs> it was good presentation, Jeta. So, uh, anyone wants to share their own experience with coping mechanism or anything? Anyone? Can I just so, uh, yes, sir. yes, yes sir. please. <laughs> Thank you, Jayita. So such a nice uh, overall comprehensive approach to this kind of everyday situation in our lives, you know, uh, not only in palliative care, but in life in general, you know, we have this whole uh, aspect of coping and staying, you know, hanging in there. So uh, I think just like everything else in palliative care for coping and resilience, we also need a holistic approach. Uh, it, it begins with yourself, you know, your self coping, and then the whole team, you know, we need to develop the whole team. The whole team must depend on each other, must encourage each other, must uh, meet together, you know, for um, discussions. And this is where, you know, home care also helps because while we are moving from one patient to another during in a vehicle, we can keep talking like this and keep encouraging. So that holistic approach is needed. And then finally, also um, for the whole organization, you know, and that is where the difficulty begins, you know, because our own colleagues can be the difficult barriers sometimes, you know, uh, often. And so uh, I have a suggestion for what we call the ivory tower syndrome. <laughs> because we all have been in our ivory towers, you know, and it is this, uh, uh, the suffering that we see that helps us to come down to earth, to come down to reality. And I think that is the same thing that is needed as we interact with our colleagues. All of us are doing, everybody's doing good work, but this is where the urgent overcomes the important and the important that is holistic approach of people who are dying gets left out. So for this, like in everything in palliative care, the stepwise approach, you know, step one. My suggestion to any junior colleague or even colleagues at the same is to first smile and greet, you know, that is one step. So every time you see this person, you smile and you say hello, and greet him, you know, he begins to wonder why is this chap trying to get my attention, you know. Then step two is, you know, 
find the person for a cup of coffee or join him for a meal while he's having and then say, sir, you know about this case, you know, I'm also, you know, involved in this, the family has talked to me. So like that, you begin a discussion about that. And then the third level would be to, you know, I mean, see when he's getting a little interested, you can, you know, have a workshop and call that person and make him the chairperson for the workshop. And, you know, so he also begins to get involved. And then finally, if nothing works, we need a dynamic approach or what we call a malignant infiltration and infiltrate and see how we can get the whole organization excited. So I just wanted to share that. And, uh, and it is important to these years, you know, that you need to be uh, focused on purpose. And that is to hang in there because you're doing it not just for yourself. Well, ultimately, you'll be doing it for yourself also because when there's a good palliative care team, it will help you also when you need it. But uh, it is to, you know, to, to share that common humanity and all these wonderful things. So thank you for the time given. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Thank, thank you, sir. I think uh, that's very important. I think we focus always on the patient's caregivers and sometimes we forget ourselves and uh, and the team. And it's very important to be inclusive as the team. As I said, you know, the uh, the training the training is done, you know, with a with, with a with it's a happy place. It's a happy place. We we feel so much better, confidence, etc. If it is something which is always critical, sometimes we have to be critical, but we have to give that respect and dignity to each of us in the team because we are talking about palliative care professionals. We can't do without each other. So we have to respect each other and uh, and that is very important. And, and also I wanted to tell the trainee is that it is something which is evolving and training does matter and coping styles and resilience will build up gradually it is not just something that you are born with and that is important so thank you very much sir, for bringing those practical strategies there are two questions here that it is sometimes very difficult to deal with our own near and dear how to deal with that when if it is we are talking about a chronic illness and uh, uh, impending death and dying, I think it is important for us, if it is our near and dear, to switch ourselves off from the professional role and be that near and dear. Because we can't, we can't really do, we can't do together, but we don't want to, uh, I, I wouldn't want to have a conflict. If it is my near and dear, I need to process all the emotions as a near and dear, and sometimes then it is difficult to give the control as the physician to someone else. That would be my, that is only my personal experience. Everybody will deal according to that. The second thing is, are there any scales to assess coping uh, in healthcare professionals? Yes, there, there are. I have given a list of that in the presentation. And of course, they can be used for regular follow-up assessment. So that is, uh, that is there. Yes, of course. So thanking the Lord for his blessings. Yes, because, you know, religious scope and spiritual scope is there. So I think that's the end of the question. Thank you, ma'am. So, Jaita, uh, it was a wonderful presentation, no doubt about it. And uh, the day uh, we are born in life in this world and the day we under start understanding world i think the day we start learning how to cope up so uh, it is not the, as uh, it is not the only palliative care situation where we have to cope up we have to cope up uh, as a uh, in the studies and then higher studies and then organization then administration and and uh, and uh, finally with your patients most of the time but uh, it is the way you will, uh, the, this presentation will definitely help you all the point-wise uh, 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 point uh, uh, instruction Dr. Jaita has given. I think we should keep this in our mind, but definitely we should try to adopt whatever which is possible for you to cope up the situation because every situation is going to be different and every time 
you will have to find out some solution for a different different situation so dr jyota thank you very much and i think this was a beautiful and wonderful presentation and i wish aisha will recover fast and her husband will recover fast so uh, we wish her speedy recovery and uh, thank you everyone for joining it was an important session and uh, i i we see so many participants taking active interest and this gives encouragement to all of us uh, thank, thank you thank you ma'am i just want to thank aisha for the presentation that uh, she had already made and i couldn't have done the presentation without her help so uh, thank you aisha thank you jyota and thank you archana and nisha thank you very much without you nothing will be possible you keep everybody on track thanks a lot thank you